So if you ever get a patient that has like chest pain from uh, constricting vessels, like if the coronary vessels were either blocked or they were undergoing vasospasms, as is the case with uh, Prince Metal's angina, then you'll get chest pain, right? The chest pain is going to be a result of an accumulation of lactic acid. So when you have lactic acidosis, that's what usually results in the pain, pain in muscles, whether you're working out or you're taking a jog, um, or if you're undergoing a myocardial infarction, you'll get that kind of like burning pain as a result of that lactic acid buildup. Uh, myocardial infarction, that's going to be a full-on occlusion of your coronary arteries, uh, resulting in ischemia and death of those cardiac myocytes. Uh, we'll talk about what the MI looks like on a EKG a little bit later today, because uh, you'll see a couple different types of MIs. But a very common type of MI you will see would, will be uh, STEMIs, right? So ST elevation MIs. So I'll talk to you guys about that a little bit later. <clears throat> and then if you were to do, uh, if you were going to try to treat um, any sort of like coronary blockage, um, you could do a couple things. You could give the patient a uh, PCI or percutaneous coronary intervention. So you could try to put a stent in. So percutaneous just means through the skin. So basically, it's a less invasive way of treating an MI versus a cabbage, because cabbage is going to be much more invasive. You literally have to go in there. Uh, it's you know cardiothoracic surgery, effectively. you got to cut the patient open um, and then do a coronary artery bypass. Some of the most common vessels for a cabbage will be the greater saphenous vein, which you find in your legs. Um, and the internal thoracics can also be used as well. Um, other vessels can be used as alternatives uh, for cabbage uh, procedures. Um, and depending on the severity of the cabbage, I've known people that have had like quintuple bypass surgery. They had to have five different vessels bypassing the area of occlusion. Um, that's, that's how serious some of those types of procedures can be. So pretty impressive stuff. So let's talk about some of the structures in the heart, um, beginning with what you find within the heart. So um, in the... Uh, and within the heart, you're going to find a bunch of different structures in the ventricles, for instance. The chordae tendinae are going to be something that's uh, pretty important in maintaining the structural integrity of your uh, valve leaflets, specifically the tricuspid as well as the mitral valve. So you can sort of think of chordae tendinae as being the heart strings of the heart. And then the coordinate tendinae are going to be attached to papillary muscles. And papillary muscles are what are embedded within the uh, the heart tissue itself. And so when the heart contracts, when the ventricles contract, the papillary muscles are also going to contract. And when they contract, they're going to be pulling on the chordae tendinae, which are going to allow for stability of the mitral valve as well as the tricuspid valve. If you had any damage to the papillary muscles, for instance, if you had ischemia uh, secondary to a myocardial infarction, papillary muscles can actually rupture. If you get a ruptured papillary muscle, all of a sudden the valve leaflet is going to go fold in on itself and you're going to have regurgitation of blood during systolic contraction. So that's a pretty serious condition. Um, and yeah, let's go on to other structures here. So within the ventricles, you're also going to see a specific type of tissue. Um, it's called tribeculae carne, um, which translates from Latin to meaty ridges. If you open up the ventricles, you'll see within the ventricle, it has all these kind of like ridge-like structures um, inside. So that's one of the distincting features of the ventricles compared to the atrium. Within the atrium, they have a different type of muscle. It's called pectinate muscles. Okay, so if you were to dissect within the, uh, the heart in the four chambers, you'll see pectinate muscles within the atrium and tribeculae carne specifically within the ventricles. Um, other things to keep in mind here, on the right side, that's going to be associated with uh, the pulmonary system, right? It's deoxygenated blood coming in from the inferior and superior vena cava into the right atrium, into the right ventricle, and then getting pumped out into the pulmonary trunk, which goes into the pulmonary arteries. Then when you get into the right side, sorry, the left side, that's going to be where you uh, have the pulmonary veins bringing oxygenated blood back to the heart uh, into the left atrium, which then gets into the left ventricle, and then systolic contraction allows oxygenated blood to thereby get pumped into the peripheral circulatory system. <clears throat> and then in terms of the valves, so we talked about the tricuspid and the mitral valve. 
the aortic and the pulmonic valve are going to be kind of like semi-lunar type valves. They kind of look like a moon a little bit. So they're going to be called uh, semi-lunar valves. So here's the atrial ventricular valves. Those are going to be the mitral as well as the tricuspid. Um, when the mitral and tricuspid valves close during systolic contraction, that's going to be the very first heart sound you hear. That's going to correspond to the lub and the lub-dub, right? When the heart goes lub-dub, 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 the first sound is going to be uh, the lub, and that's the mitral and tricuspid valves closing. So when the ventricles contract, mitral valve and tricuspid close, so you don't get regurgitation of blood back into the atrium. Um, and then when you have, uh, uh, when the ventricles start to relax, then the pressure is going to build up in both the pulmonary as well as the uh, atrium. And by the way, uh, do you guys have like a comment or a question or anything back there? Some of your classmates are getting a little distracted, so try to keep the chatter to a minimum. So the dub in the lub dub is going to be that second sound. And when you get the pulmonic as well as the um, aortic valves closing, that's going to be that second heart sound. So just keep in mind, when you hear your lub, when you're auscultating a patient's heart sounds, the first one, mitral and tricuspid valves closing. The second sound is going to be aortic and pulmonic valves closing. So this is the basic, uh, phys well, not really physiology, but the mechanics of a valve, right? Valves allow for... Uh, unidirectional flow of anything, whether it's, you know, fluids, blood, whatever. Um, unidirectional flow. If you have buildup of pressure behind the valve, the valve opens, it allows for fluids to move through. As soon as the pressure builds up on the other end of the valve, that's when the valve closes and it prevents uh, regurgitation of flow. And so if you had uh, mitral valve, for instance, mitral valve prolapse, if one of those papillary muscles may be ruptured after an MI, then the valve would basically fail and then open up and you're going to have regurgitation of blood back into the previous chamber, into the atrium. <clears throat> and then um, this is what it would look like with a schematic of blood flow. So let's follow the blood here. So this, this is the right atrium and then here's the left atrium. So right atrium, that's going to be coming from the systemic circuit, right? So it's bringing deoxygenated blood to the heart um, <clears throat> as the... Uh, atrium contracts, it's going to bring blood into the ventricle. As the ventricles contract, uh, it's going to increase the pressure within the ventricles, and you're going to have the mitral as well as the tricuspid valves closing up. Okay, so it's going to prevent backflow of blood. Um, <clears throat> and then as the pressure builds up even further with ventricular contraction, then you're going to have the uh, both pulmonic as well as the aortic valves open up, and it's going to allow for blood to move through those vessels. So aortic valve is going to bring blood to the systemic uh, circulation. Pulmonic is going to bring uh, blood into the respiratory system. <clears throat> so let's talk about when these valves start to fail or if they have any sort of defects. Um, if, the, if the valves are stiffened up and become narrower, we call that stenosis. And so, for instance, you could get like mitral valve stenosis. Um, if you get mitral valve stenosis, you're going to get, uh, you're going to have a hard time bringing blood from that left atrium into the left ventricle, right? Because you have a tighter uh, stenotic opening, it's going to prevent blood uh, from flowing freely from the left atrium into the left uh, ventricle. Um, one of the major causes of mitral valve stenosis is going to be rheumatic heart disease. So rheumatic fever is a secondary consequence of scarlet fever, which is secondary to uh, strep. Uh, Streptococcus pyogenes. So it's actually uh, the same bug that causes uh, sore throat. Right? So strep throat, if left untreated in some patients, can eventually become systematic, can eventually turn into scarlet fever, can eventually turn into rheumatic heart disease. So that's a pretty scary situation. Oftentimes the patient is going to require a mitral valve replacement surgery. So they'll actually have to go in there and put in a, a prosthetic, uh, prosthetic heart valve. So not a good situation. Um, note, you can hear a murmur when you have a stenosis, right? So if you have a really tight opening when the blood is pumping through, it's going to result in a murmur. And a murmur is just an abnormal heart sound. It's as simple as that. Um, mitral valve prolapse, on the other hand, um, that's when you have uh, blood regurgitating back into 
um, <clears throat> back into the previous chamber. So for the mitral valve, you'd have blood going from the left ventricle back into the left atrium. Um, that also can result in a heart murmur. So if you had mitral valve uh, prolapse, you would get a specific type of murmur. Um, so let's think about what kind of murmur, what kind of heart sound that would be when you listen to it on an on a, uh, uh, auscultation. So syst systole is when you have uh, your heart contracting. Diastole is when you have relaxation of the heart. Now, if you had a uh, mitral valve stenosis, what kind of murmur would you hear? Would you hear a systolic or a diastolic murmur? Mm -mm. So let's look at the chambers here as they fill. So during diastole, that's when you have blood, like the heart is relaxing and then blood is filling into the different chambers, okay? So that's diastole. Versus systole is when you have contraction of atrium as well as the ventricles. So systole, especially with the uh, ventricles, that's gonna be really important in bringing blood from the right heart, uh, right ventricle into the pulmonary system, and then from the left ventricle into the peripheral circulatory system. So that would be systolic contraction. What happens during systole? Which valve is closing during systole? Two valves. So the very first valves that close, that result in that lub sound, tricuspid and mitral valve, okay? So if you had, let's say that mitral valve failed during ventricular contraction and then you had regurgitation, what, when would you hear the sound from that regurgitation? Would it be during systole or diastole? Anyone? Take a guess. Huh? During diastole? Okay, good try. Wrong. <laughs> but when the ventricles contract, and if the valve prolapses backwards, right, the mitral valve prolapses, then you're going to get a systolic murmur. So it's going to be lub, dub, lub, dub. So you're going to hear a whooshing sound from the blood as it regurgitates back into the atrium. So if you're listening to the patient's heart sound, you'll hear a murmur uh, between S1 and S2. So those are the two heart sounds, okay? Versus if you had mitral valve stenosis, as the blood is entering into the ventricle, the blood's going to be entering through the ventricle during diastole. You'd be hearing more of a, pro a prominent like diastolic murmur with uh, mitral valve uh, stenosis. Now, if you had, um, let's see, if you had a failure of the aortic valve, um, when would you hear a murmur? So if the aortic valve, for whatever reason, uh, regurgitated, huh? it, would be, it would be a diastolic. Because yeah? then you have blood kind of entering back into the ventricle through the aortic valve. So you'd hear a diastolic murmur. So I'll play you a couple of sa um, samples of what those different types of murmurs sound like so you get a, a good idea. This is an image from your textbook. It just basically summarizes everything we just talked about in terms of all the different valves as well as the different chambers and whatnot. So let's hear what a normal heart sound sounds like. Let's see if I can crank up the volume here. So that's lub dub, just normal heart sound. That's normal S1 and S2, okay? All right, so I'll play you what some of the other actual murmurs would sound like, as opposed to that. So if he has uh, stenosis, um, <clears throat> uh, you would hear uh, stenosis as you had blood trying to push through that narrowing of the valve. And then regurgitation murmur, that's going to be blood leaking backwards. Okay, So let's hear what the mitral, mitral valve stenosis sounds like. So lub, dub. And then the sound is happening after uh, S2. Can you guys hear that sound? You hear that whooshing sound after S2. So S1, between S1 and S2, that's going to be uh, systolic contraction of the ventricle. Um, and if you had stenosis of the mitral valve, that means the mitral valve is going to have a hard time allowing blood to come in from the atrium into the left ventricle. 
So that's going to result in a diastolic murmur. Okay? And then regurgitation is going to be a systolic murmur. You're going to hear that sound between S1 and S2. Okay? So you can barely even hear S1, S2. All you're hearing is that whooshing sound. So it goes, so that's S1 and S2. It's going to be a, a systolic type murmur. Does that make sense to you guys? I'm not going to test you on the, on the types of murmurs. That's a little bit more advanced. But in the future, when you're listening to your patients and you hear a diastolic murmur, if you hear a systolic murmur, then you're going to be able to better identify what valves might be implicated in those, um, those pathological heart sounds. Okay? Cool. So let's talk about uh, just kind of overview of the circulatory system in terms of systemic versus pul uh, pulmonary system. Your inferior vena cava and superior vena cava. Uh, kind of important to know which regions of the body are going to be associated with which. Um, superior vena cava is going to be associated with uh, upper extremities. Inferior vena cava is going to be mostly lower extremities. Um, and then just note that blood is going to be coming in from uh, the vena cavas, both inferior and superior, into the right atrium. Okay. That's going to be the, the first point of contact of the heart. And then into the right ventricle, then it's going to get pumped out into the pulmonary artery, right? The pulmonary artery. Make sure you know the difference between pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein, right? Because pulmonary artery deoxygenated blood, but because it's an artery, it's bringing blood away from the heart. And then into the pulmonary cir uh, circulation, to the capillary beds where you can have perfusion of oxygen on the erythrocytes, bringing that oxygenated blood back to the heart through the pulmonary vein, okay? And then from the pulmonary vein, it's going to enter into the atrium, left atrium, and it's going to enter into the left ventricle. And from the left ventricle, it's going to get pumped out um, into the aorta. <clears throat> so here's just a summary of all that. So uh, superior inferior vena cava, right atrium, into the right ventricle, pulmonary trunk, pulmonary artery, into the pulmonary system then into the pulmonary veins, left atrium, left ventricle, and then into the aorta, into your systemic circulation. Cool. Any questions on that so far? So let's talk about electrical conductivity. Okay, So the heart is going to have a few different sites where you have the origin of electrical signals. The most important one is going to be the SA node. That's the sinoatrial node. And that's going to sit just at the top of the right atrium the top, sort of lateral, and that's going to be the pacemaker. That's the natural pacemaker of the heart. So that sets the heart rate for your, uh, for your heart to pump properly. The AV node is going to be the uh, border between the atrium and the ventricles. That's the atrioventricular node. So with the SA node is going to depolarize. It's going to send an electrical signal that conducts all the way to the AV node. The AV node is going to be special because it slows down the electrical signal. You want that signal to slow down because you want the atriums to fully contract first, and then you want the ventricles to fully contract second. Okay, So you're going to have the signal getting sent from SA to the AV node. It's going to slow down at the AV node, and then it's going to travel through the bundle of Hiss. And after it passes the bundle of Hiss, it's going to bifurcate into the right and left uh, bundle branches. Um, <clears throat> and then once it travels through the intraventricular septum, that's where you have those two uh, bundle branches, uh, it's going to eventually make its way to the apex of the heart, which is going to be this region right here. And then as it uh, moves further, it's going to enter into the Purkinje fibers. And those Purkinje, uh, Purkinje fibers are what allow for uh, uh, synchronized ventricular contraction. Okay. And we're going to talk about how um, sometimes those signals might uh, become pathological, might be, become damaged, maybe due to ischemia, maybe due to scarring. And then you get things like cardiac arrhythmias. You can get heart blocks. You can get all sorts of different things that can happen if you have defective circuitry uh, arising from uh, both SA node and other areas in the heart as well. So the interesting, what's up? What was the question again? If 
not to my knowledge. As far as I know, they're all the same throughout the heart. So um, maybe look that up and see if because I, I don't know that off the top of my head. I don't. I think from my, from what I understand, they're all the same. Yeah. All right. So the interesting thing about um, the heart is that it is auto auto rhythmic. So it's going to beat by itself. Uh, when I was at ASU during my undergrad uh, and I was a freshman in biology, I did one of the most. It was a lab that I took for uh, Gen Bio. It was a pretty ghastly lab. I hope they stopped it because it's kind of. It seems a little unethical. We would put frogs in a solution so that they would become sedated, and then we would basically remove the heart while the frog was still alive. <laughs> and the only purpose of that study or that procedure was to see how long the heart would beat independently outside of the body. And my frog was 22 minutes. <laughs> and that was like the only reason why we killed the frog. So I don't know, if it, to me it seemed like something you could probably just read in the textbook and you know, get the gist, but I don't know. Um, if, uh, if it were today, I probably wouldn't do that. <laughs> but I was, a, you know, I was a freshman, so I didn't know any better. Um, anyway, so that's auto, <laughs> auto rhythmic beating. So the heart can actually beat by itself outside of the heart, uh, outside of the body, independent from uh, any sort of external stimulus. Um, and then myogenic is going to be the other term for that, right? So you have heart beating, uh, sorry, uh, the heart beat is going to be basically uh, conducted within the actual heart tissue. <clears throat> so we already kind of talked about the SA node as being the major uh, uh, node that sets the pulse, so it's the p uh, pulse maker or pacemaker. Um, and then the AV node, that's where you have that signal getting s a little bit slower so that you allow for uh, sy uh, synchronicity in the ventricular contraction. <clears throat> so this basically just summarizes what I just talked about. Um, and then the Purkinje fibers, that's what's going to allow for the greater amount of syn uh, uh, synchronicity in the ventricular contraction. So it allows for uh, maximization of that ventricular ejection. Okay. <clears throat> So here's just another summary of what that looks like. So SA node to AV node to the bundle hiss, right and left bundle branches, and then into the Purkinje fibers. Pretty straight, straightforward stuff. So let's talk about the cardiac myocytes versus the SA nodes. So the, the nodes are going to be a little bit different, but the cardiac myocytes, um, the way that they're able to undergo synchronized contraction is because of these intercalated discs. So each cardiac myocyte is basically going to be tightly associated with each other. They're going to have not only desmosomes, which provide like structural int integrity and support, so it allows them to be nice and tightly fixed together, but they're also going to have gap junctions. So within these intercalated discs, you find gap junctions as well as those desmosomes. So the desmosomes are important for mechanical and structural stability versus the uh, gap junctions. The gap junctions are specifically going to allow for the movement of ions from cell to cell. So as one cardiac myocyte depolarizes, it's going to release a flood of calcium. That calcium is going to move into the adjacent cardiac myocyte through the gap junction, and it's going to stimulate a contraction in that muscle uh, cell as well. Okay, So that's going to be the most important thing that's different about uh, cardiac myocytes versus like skeletal muscle, for example. <clears throat> and then... So here's another image of what that looks like. So these are the desmosomes, which allow for structural and mechanical uh, integrity versus the gap junctions, which allow for that uh, ions and electrical signal to be transferred from uh, cell to cell. Another image of what that looks like. Now, in terms of the SA node, the SA node is going to be the most important one in terms of maintaining the pace of the heart. Right. And generally speaking, the SA node is going to depolarize about anywhere between 70 to 80 times per minute. OK, so that's going to be kind of within like normal range for your heart rate. What's the what's the normal heart rate? What's the range? 60 to 100. Exactly. So it's going to be within that normal within that normal range. <clears throat> so how does. Uh, how do the ions come into play with contractility? So let's talk about the pacemaker cells. So that's going to be what you find in the sinoatrial node, the SA node. So it's going to happen in a few different steps. Um, the first step is going to be involving these funny channels. So they're called uh, 
uh, sodium voltage gated uh, channels, and they're going to uh, allow for sodium to enter into the cell, but at a very slow rate. So that's why they're called funny channels. They're also called pacemaker channels or hyperpolarization activated cyclic nucleotide gated channels. That's like a mouthful. So we can just call them funny channels for the purpose of this class. And then you're going to reach a threshold. Once you hit that threshold, then you're going to actually depolarize the cell. Um, they do have a lower threshold than neurons. It's going to be roughly 40 to 50 millivolts. And then once that happens, it's going to allow for calcium to enter into the cell. The cardiac myocyte is very sensitive to extracellular levels of calcium. So calcium, once it enters into the cell, it's going to also release calcium from the end, um, endoplasmic reticulum and, so that it further causes a depolarization. So I'll show you an image of what that looks like in a second. Then once you have repolarization, to bring it back to uh, um, base level, those calcium channels are gonna, are gonna close up and then potassium is what's gonna allow for uh, repolarization. So potassium permeability is going to increase and in order for the cell to uh, go back down to roughly 60 to 70 millivolts, you're going to have to release cal uh, potassium outside of the cell. So you're going to allow for efflux of potassium. I'm going to show you what that looks like here. So um, outside of the cell, you're going to have a higher level of both sodium as well as calcium. Within the cell, you have a higher level of potassium. And then at the pacemaker or the SA node, um, these funny sodium channels, you're going to have a very slow, uh, you're going to have a slow um, influx of sodium, okay? But then once you hit that threshold, roughly like 40 or so millivolts, negative 40, then you're going to have the uh, calcium channels open up and then you have a flood of calcium very rapidly. And then once you depolarize, then you're going to have potassium as being the next component that allows for repolarization. So potassium eventually is going to, eat, is going to be uh, released from the cell, bringing it back down to about negative 60 millivolts. And then we're going to talk about the cardiac myocyte action potential uh, in a moment here. But this is the pacemaker, right? That's the SA. That's what's happening at the SA node. And this is what's actually happening as a consequence within the actual cardiac myocytes. So this is the depolarization resulting in muscle contraction. So let's compare neurons very briefly to autorhythmic cells. So neurons are a little bit different. Um, they're basically all or nothing, right? So they either depolarize or they don't depolarize. And it's going to be moderated uh, or mediated by voltage-gated sodium channels um, versus the autorhythmic cells. Autorhythmic cells are going to have those funny channels, right, the IF channels. And those funny channels are going to allow for a slow depolarization until you hit that threshold. Once you hit that threshold, that's when you have the influx of calcium into the cell. So slow, funny channels allow for slow depolarization until you reach that threshold of about negative 40, then you have rapid depolarization, and then those calcium channels basically close down after depolarization, and then repolarization is gonna predominantly involve uh, potassium. <clears throat> okay. So here's another image of what that looks like. So this is where you have your uh, funny channels, slow depolarization involving sodium influx. Then you have potassium, sorry, calcium channels opening up as you have that rapid uh, calcium depolarization. And then you have repolarization using uh, potassium efflux. <clears throat> so let's talk about the calcium, uh, the role that calcium plays in this. So um, calcium is going to be coming in most, uh, like about 20% is going to be coming in from the extracellular fluid. So it's going to be coming in from outside of the cell. Once calcium enters into the cell, it's going to stimulate um, the, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is kind of similar to the endoplasmic reticulum, except it's going to be predominantly involved in calcium. Once that sarcoplasmic reticulum gets activated, then you're going to have the release of about 80% uh, of the remaining calcium required for the actual contraction of the cardiac myocyte. So you don't need to know exactly like each different type of channel that's involved. Just know that there's going to be a sodium potassium um, ATPase type pump. Um, there's also a sodium calcium exchanger. And then that sarcoplasmic reticulum, that's going to be where you find the majority of the calcium that's involved in the actual contraction. 
<clears throat> so let's talk about sympathetic versus parasympathetic um, activation. So the autonomic nervous system will also have an effect on either the rapidity or the slow, the slower um, heart rate. So either tachycardia versus bradycardia. So tachycardia is what we, uh, that's the term for accelerated heart rate. Anything above 100 beats per minute is, a, is considered tachycardia. Um, anything below 60 is going to be technically considered bradycardia unless you're an athlete. If you're an athlete that does a lot of like cardiovascular training, generally speaking, your resting heart rate is actually going to be pretty slow. Back when I used to be a hiker, when I used to exercise regularly, my resting heart rate was roughly 50 to the point that like uh, medical assistants would freak out. They'd be like, oh my God, your heart rate is way too slow. It's like, yeah, it's because I'm actually in shape. <laughs> but uh, generally speaking though, uh, below 60 would be considered bradycardia. So sympathetic stimulation is going to uh, induce tachycardia, so it's going to increase your heart rate, versus parasympathetic stimulation is going to decrease heart rate. <clears throat> so let's talk about that in this, uh, for a little bit here. So when you stimulate the heart rate through sympathetic activation, um, you're going to have increased SA no depolarization, so that's going to increase the heart rate. You're going to have a shorter repolarization phase and a faster depolarization phase. So everything is basically happening in a shorter period of time and much more rapidly. Um, and then when you increase contractility, as a consequence, you're also going to increase the person's blood pressure. Right? So your blood pressure is going to go up. Versus parasymp parasympathetic stimulation, it's a little bit different. You're going to have decreased SA stimulation, decreased heart rate. You're going to actually result in hyper uh, polarization. So you're going to have this hyper polarization phase. It's going to dip um, a little bit below normal. Um, and then you're going to have slower repolarization, decreased contractility, decreased overall blood pressure. All right, so basically the opposite effect between sympathetic and parasympathetic simulation. So let's talk about the actual cardiac myocytes. So when you get that SA node stimulation, right, you get the, um, the depolarization you're also going to depolarize your cardiac myocytes. So let's talk about those different phases. Very similar in terms of the pattern of ions that are involved. The very first thing that's going to happen is going to be uh, sodium. is going to be rapidly causing depolarization. As those sodium channels close down, then you're going to have this plateau phase. So it's kind of like this plateau refractory period um, where you have uh, calcium being implicated. Towards the end of the plateau phase, that's when the calcium channels basically close, and then when you have repolarization, same thing with the SA nodes. You're going to have potassium being involved in that. So potassium is going to basically uh, be released from the cell to allow the cell to uh, drop down to uh, hmm, its normal resting membrane potential. And then once it gets down to the resting membrane potential, um, you're going to have a couple different pumps involved. So you're going to have uh, potassium, uh, potassium, sodium, ATPase, you're also going to uh, have to release that calcium from the cell, right? So you can allow for adequate amounts of repolarization. Uh, repolarization. So you're going to bring calcium outside of the cell. You're also going to put calcium back into that sarcoplasmic, sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay? So that's what's going to happen uh, during the uh, phase four. So depolarization, to summarize here, it goes very rapidly. So it's going to be a very brief period where you're allowing sodium to enter into the cell. Once you uh, hit 30 millivolts, positive 30 millivolts, then you're going to have that second phase. And that second phase where you have that plateau, that allows for sustained contraction. <clears throat> and, the, and one of the reasons why you want to do sustained contraction is because you want the heart to completely contract, so you allow the a maximum amount of blood to get pumped out, right? So that's going to be why sustained contraction is very important. And that plateau phase is going to happen for a very long period of time compared to other uh, types of uh, cells. So for instance, um, in skeletal muscle, that action potential duration is going to be much more rapid. It's going to be much quicker versus uh, the cardiac myocytes. The, uh, that prolonged period of sustained contraction is going to be much, much longer. And then repolarization, calcium channels close, potassium channels open, and then you have efflux of potassium outside of the cell. <clears throat> and then um, in terms of calcium's involvement, like I said earlier, uh, 
the extracellular, uh, um, um, extracellular calcium is going to account for 20%. Okay? It's going to be 20%. The rest is going to be found within the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. So 20% is going to be associated with extracellular levels of calcium. The other 80% are going to be intracellular within the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So here's a summary of what that looks like. So over here, you have that rapid depolarization. Sodium enters into the cell. It peaks at about positive 30 millivolts. Then you have that prolonged plateau that's going to be associated with calcium. And then uh, towards the end of that plateau, this, that's going to be the refractory period, by the way. At the end of that refractory period, that's when you're going to have potassium um, leaving those cardiac myocytes. <clears throat> so this is... a a comparison of your skeletal muscles, which happens much more rapidly, right? It has a much more narrow refractory period versus the uh, cardiac myocytes. So skeletal muscle, very quick, versus cardiac muscle, it's going to be much more prolonged, all right? So that's really important so that you get maximum amount of blood getting pumped out of the ventricles. So <clears throat> once you get that um, action potential, then you're going to have the actual contraction of the, of the cardiac myocytes. So the action potential has to happen first, right? So voltage-gated sodium channels, then that plateau with calcium. And then during that period of the uh, refractory period, that's when you have the cardiac myocyte actually contracted. Okay? So some of the major differences uh, between skeletal muscle as well as cardiac muscle, that's going to be that all-or-nothing uh, law. Okay? So for, um, for uh, skeletal muscles, sorry, for cardiac muscles, you have those gap junctions. Those gap junctions allow for uh, the movement of calcium from one cell to another, allowing for a greater degree of synchronicity. That's going to be one of the major differences. Also, just the fact that there's automaticity in cardiac myocytes, that's going to be another uh, distinguishing factor between skeletal muscle versus cardiac muscle. And then the length of that refractory period, that's going to be one of the major differences as well. So much longer refractory period in the cardiac myocytes. <clears throat> so let's talk about uh, what that looks like in terms of stimulation versus contraction. So this down here would be uh, in your uh, skeletal muscles. So if you have one stimulus that results in a contraction, um, if you have multiple stimuli taking place, that's when you can uh, enter into a state of like tetany, where you have like spastic type contractions. All right, here's another summary of what that looks like when it comes to the actual uh, signals uh, of depolarization versus the actual contraction. Cool, so any questions on that? Any questions on the ions that are involved? It's pretty straightforward for both the SA nodes uh, as well as the cardiac myocytes. They're all going to involve sodium, calcium, and potassium. So sodium is always going to come first. That's going to be the major thing that stimulates the actual depolarization. Then you have calcium, uh, which is going to further the contraction of those myocytes. And then potassium is where you allow the cell to repolarize at the end. You guys have any questions on that, or is it pretty straightforward? Cool. Let's talk about EKGs. So... <clears throat> Um, EKG is pretty standard uh, procedure. Um, basically, any patient that comes into the ER, uh, we're going to put them on an EKG, especially if they're complaining of things like chest pain, difficulty breathing, anything that you suspect might be involving some form of like cardiovascular uh, underlying disease or etiology, you're going to give the patient EKG. Or if the patient is ODing on drugs, or if they got into a motor, motor vehicle accident, or if the patient is, uh, has a fever, right? If the patient has like some sort of like bacterial infection, that's going to be something that maybe results in like tachycardia for the patient. So you're going to put the patient on an EKG. So we're going to talk about all the different sections in uh, the EKG, all the different waves. I'm not going to go into detail about like the 12 lead EKG. Um, that is like way more advanced. That's like med, med school level uh, physiology. So we're just going to go through the basics of what those different EKG uh, waves are going to stand for. So let's talk about it. So the first wave is going to be the P wave. That's going to be associated with atrial depolarization. As the atria depolarize, you're going to see that first blip. So that's going to be the P wave. 
the little section between the P uh, wave and the R wave, that's going to be referred to as the PR segment. During this region right here, the PR segment, that's where you have atrial contraction. Okay, So you have depolarization first, and then the muscle actually contracts during that PR interval. Then in the QRS complex, this whole entire region is called the QRS complex, you're going to have both atrial repolarization okay, and simultaneously you're going to have ventricular depolarization. Okay, And then you're going to have the ST segment. And the ST segment, that's going to correspond to ventricular contraction. So over here, the QRS complex, you have ventricular depolarization, and then you have um, the uh, ST segment, that's where you're going to have the actual physical contraction of those ventricular myocytes. And then you finally have the T wave, and the T wave is going to be associated with ventricular repolarization. Okay, we're going to go into detail about this, so don't, don't fret. This is a really good image that summarizes basically everything I just told you. So the very first blip, that's going to be your P wave. Um, that's going to correspond to um, atrial depolarization. Then you have the PR segment. That's going to be the actual atrium finally contracting. And then uh, once you get into the QRS complex, you're going to have both uh, atrial repolarization as well as ventricular depolarization. So that's going to be this region right here. And then during that ST segment, that's where you're going to have ventricular contraction, right? And then after contraction is done, then you're going to have ventricular repolarization, which is going to correspond to uh, the T wave. <clears throat> so we'll go over those in a little bit more detail again. So P wave, atrial depolarization, then atrial contraction takes place in the PR segment. Um, QRS complex, both atrial repolarization as well as ventricular depolarization. And then ST segment over here is going to be ventricular contraction. And then the T wave is going to be associated with ventricular repolarization. When a cell repolarizes, what's the ion that's going to be involved in that? Huh? Potassium. Awesome. So um, you can actually diagnose different types of like potassium uh, imbalances. So if you have hyperkalemia, which is the, the fancy term for too much potassium in your body, um, hyperkalemia can actually affect that T wave. So if you have a patient, you look at their EKG and you see spiked T waves, that spiked T wave is going to be corresponding to uh, hyperkalemia or too much potassium. Um, and depending on the quantity of potassium or the concentration, um, all the way up to over 7.5 uh, millimoles per liter, you can have all sorts of different stuff happening. For instance, you can have flattening of that P wave. Um, you could have prolongation of that PR interval. Um, you could have prolongation of the QRS complex. Eventually, if you have way too much potassium, you can start getting this weird sine wave pattern, which is uh, not a good situation. So you definitely want to uh, correct that patient's potassium. Otherwise, you, you might inadvertently start getting into different types of cardiac arrhythmias as a result. So here's basically a summary of all those different waves and what they correspond to. We already talked about it enough. I'm not going to beat a dead horse with that. Hmm. And here's a really good summary in terms of the, uh, the EKG findings as well as the different parts of the heart that are contracting as a result. So when you have that P wave, um, atrial depolarization, then you're going to have the atria depolarizing and then eventually resulting in a uh, atrial contraction. Versus the QRS complex, that's when you get ventricular depolarization resulting in ventricular contraction. <clears throat> cool. So let's talk a little bit about pulse rate. Um, as we already mentioned, bradycardia is basically anything that's going to be under 60 beats per minute. Not always abnormal, right? So if you have somebody that's an athlete or you know, jogger, um, they're going to be sometimes maybe hovering around like 50 beats per minute. That is completely normal. Okay, you don't have to like treat that. But these are some other conditions that might result in uh, bradycardia. You might just get it as a consequence of aging, getting older. Um, you can get it from even like heart disease or damage to those cardiac uh, tissues. So lots of different things can result in uh, bradycardia. Um, hypothyroidism, right? If you have a, if you're not getting enough T3, T4, that's going to actually like not only 
lower your basic metabolic rate, it's also going to result in bradycardia. Um, versus tachycardia. Tachycardia is interesting because there's a lot of other conditions that result in tachycardia, uh, most notably fever. So if a patient has a bacterial infection of any sort um, and they become febrile, or even if they have like a viral infection that can result in fever, they're going to probably become tachycardic. Um, alcohol. Alcohol withdrawal is another thing that can result in tachycardia. Now, if you guys go into psych, um, have you guys ever heard of delirium tremens? Okay, so you guys are probably, gonna, if any of you go into ER, or if any of you guys go into like psych, and you go into like uh, substance use disorders, um, alcoholism can result in uh, withdrawal symptoms. And if a patient undergoes withdrawal symptoms, uh, they can potentially go into delirium tremens. Uh, delirium tremens is a really dangerous condition. It's a life-threatening condition. There are, not only does their blood pressure go up, their temperature also goes up, and their heart rate goes up. If their heart rate goes above 100, you're, uh, you should be very concerned because that patient could eventually go into coma. They could eventually go into death. Alcohol withdrawals, by the way, that's going to be the only substance that can result in fatal withdrawal symptoms. Opioids do not kill you if you're withdrawing. It's uncomfortable. It's very painful. But it's not going to kill you. Alcohol withdrawals can send you into what you call autonomic instability, where your heart just starts going crazy. It doesn't, it's like beating uh, in ways that it shouldn't be beating. So that's one big concern with alcoholism. Um, caffeine, obviously, is going to result in uh, uh, tachycardia, including stimulants like cocaine, amphetamines, all those types of drugs that are like psychostimulants are going to result in uh, tachycardia. Um, electrolyte imbalances can result in tachycardia. Hyperthyroidism can also result in tachycardia. If you're anemic, you're not delivering enough blood or oxygen to your peripheral tissues. In order to try to compensate for that, your heart is also going to start beating much more rapidly, right? So anemia, also, um, if, you're, uh, uh, if you're bleeding out, right, if you're hemorrhaging, if you get into a motor vehicle accident and you start bleeding out, you're gonna, your heart's going to try to overcompensate for that. It's going to start beating really rapidly. So let's talk about um, some of the arrhythmias. We're going to get into that in a second here. So normal sinus rhythm, that's the way that we refer to as a patient that just has a normal heartbeat on an EKG. We refer to that as normal sinus rhythm. Sinus, you can think of that as being originating from the sinoatrial node, okay? So they have a normal heartbeat. Tachycardic, over 100 beats per minute. Bradycardic, less than 60 beats per minute. And then arrhythmias, which just means abnormal rhythms. And there's multiple different types of arrhythmias. We're going to talk about those uh, in a little bit more detail now. So arrhythmias can be a result of multiple different things. Um, most commonly, though, um, they could be a result of ectopic foci. If you have an ectopic foci, that means that you have uh, basically a pacemaker that's not supposed to be there. <laughs> okay, So you have like a pacemaker in a different part of your heart where it's starting to send off and fire off signals, resulting in depolarization, and it's going to result in a, like a wonky type of depolarization. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then arrhythmias, as I mentioned, those are going to be just abnormal beats. Um, you can get those from heart blocks. There's a bunch of different types of heart blocks, but you can get bundled branch blocks, also referred to as triple B. You can get a complete total heart block, which I'm going to show you images of what those look like. Um, in terms of ectopic foci, um, sometimes those uh, arise just spontaneously. Um, sometimes you have these re-entry circuits. If you have like a re-entry circuit, have you guys ever heard of catheter ablations? Yeah, you've heard of what, what, what What's a catheter ablation? Do you know? Oh, really? Yeah. Do they go into the femoral uh, vein? Nice. So catheter ablation is a procedure where they go into the femoral vein, so they bring a catheter all the way up, and then they basically just zap. They zap scar tissue. So they're going to cause, like, uh, they're going to basically break the, those reentry circuits. And so it allows that SA node to be the primary pacemaker once again. Um, how's she doing? Did she do better? No? She was. She was. Oh, bummer. Um, do you know what she had? Did she have like AFib? <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> Blame the kids. <laughs> um, I don't think that's uh, medically uh, correct. <laughs> I mean, stress, I guess. Man. Stress can affect your heart, so maybe. Who knows? But... <laughs> 
Um, yeah, anyways. So this over here on the top right, um, that's an image of what atrial fibrillation looks like. Basically, you have all these crazy reentry circuits just looping around in the atrium. And so what happens to the atrium, it just starts freaking out and it starts spasming. And so you're not getting full contractions of the atrium. Um, you can get atrial contractions up to 500 beats per minute. It's not really a beat because you can't really see what's going on. They're basically all just kind of like firing randomly. Um, so you can sort of say that's a really, really, really rapid um, heart rate. Now, there's a couple drugs you could use. You could use like beta blockers, which block those beta adrenergic cells, B1. Um, you could use calcium channel blockers. You could use digoxin. Um, also, blood thinners. Why would you want to thin the patient's blood if they have atrial fibrillation? We talked about this a little bit before when we were talking about the clotting cascade, but it's good just to kind of recap. So I'll give you a personal vignette. Uh, my dad, he's 93 years old, so he's pretty old. Um, he's had long-standing atrial fibrillation. And for like over a decade, he was taking warfarin. Warfarin, also known as Coumadin. So that's a blood thinner, right? And so um, over the summer, last summer, um, he was sort of having falls. Like he was falling a lot. And the problem with warfarin as a blood thinner is that patients that are on warfarin are bleeding risks. So if a person falls, they might burst a vessel, and then they can bleed out very rapidly. So what his primary care doctor did, she took him off warfarin and put him on, God, she didn't really put him on anything, to be honest with you. Like a week and a half later, my dad got a stroke. And thank God it was just an occipital lobe stroke. He, he still has a hard time walking, but at least he's still there. Um, so warfarin is really important for patients with atrial fibrillation because as you're blood starts to pool in the atrium. If you don't get proper contractions, that blood starts to coagulate. And if the blood coagulates, you can potentially get an embolic type stroke. All right, that's the biggest concern. Um, and so I was really pissed off that they took him off warfarin. I kind of yelled at it, the doctor. And so she put him on baby aspirin. So now he's on aspirin, 81 milligrams. He's doing a lot better. But if you have a patient on, uh, with atrial fibrillation, it's really, really important to give them blood thinners. To me, I feel like the risk of bleed outweighs the risk of stroke, because I think stroking out is a little bit worse uh, than bleeding up. That's just my opinion. That's how medicine works. You always kind of weigh the benefits over the risks. Uh, premature atrial contractions, that means you just have like a surprise atrial contraction. Um, you can get that through like drug use, through stress, caffeine, nothing really too crazy. It's like all of a sudden the ventricles just decide to spontaneously contract. Nothing really too crazy. Um, sorry, uh, the atria spontaneously contracts, resulting in a ventricular contraction right here. Um, paroxysmal atrial uh, tachycardia, that's going to be where you have uh, a series of, uh, basically you have the atrium starts going out of hand, but still the ventricles are able to keep pace with the atria. Okay, So you can get really rapid heart rate. So you can get a beat of like about 180 beats per minute, which is like extremely tachycardic, but the ventricles are still fully operating. Now, the biggest concern is with ventricular uh, arrhythmias. So ventricular arrhythmias are extremely dangerous, um, especially this one down here at the bottom. So compare atrial fibrillation over here, where you can't really see the P waves too well. There's like so many of them because it's just, everything's just rapidly beating in the atrium. Everything's depolarizing willy-nilly without control. Ventricular tachycardia is sort of similar, but it's happening to the ventricles. When it happens to the atria, you could still survive, right? You might have that increased chance of getting like an embolic stroke, secondary to uh, coagulation of the blood. But if you have ventricular tachycardia, or ventricular fibrillation, rather, the ventricles are fluttering so much, you're not getting any blood getting pumped out. And what happens to the patient? They go into cardiac arrest. And if you try to feel their pulse, you're not going to feel the pulse at all you're getting barely any like, contraction whatsoever. Um, you can also get premature ventricular contractions. It's not really anything too crazy. Um, basically, you just have Purkinje cells doing their own thing. And ventricular tachycardia is where you have multiple uh, PVCs uh, happening in unison. So it's like four or more uh, PVCs, and that's considered uh, VTAC, ventricular tachycardia. These patients, it's still pretty dangerous. 
but you can like cardiovert the patient. It's not really like the end of the world. Uh, VTAC though, uh, sorry, VFib, that's fatal. The patient will die. So you definitely want to uh, uh, defibrillate the patient. So you need to zap them. <clears throat> Summary of all that. Let's talk about some of the uh, heart blocks, the AV blocks. These ones are actually kind of interesting. This is like, you're not responsible for these, uh, for the exam or anything. This is like med school level uh, heart, heart blocks. Uh, but there's several different types. So <clears throat> if you have a first degree heart block, um, basically you just have widening of the PR interval. So the P, uh, the P uh, you have the atrial depolarization, but then you're not really getting like proper ventricular uh, depolarization as well. So that's going to be considered a first degree heart block. You just basically have a widening of that PR interval. Second degree heart block, there are a couple different types. So there's Mobitz type 1, also referred to as Winky Box. Um, <clears throat> this one's kind of interesting. You have, here's your P interval, or P wave, right? So you have P wave here, P wave here, P wave here, P wave here. Each one of these is corresponding with the QRS complex. But if you note, as you move along, so this first one, pretty short PR interval. The second one gets a little bit wider. The third one gets even wider than that. And then on that last one, the QRS complex completely drops. No QR complex whatsoever. Okay, so that's going to be considered a second degree heart block. You have progressive widening of the PR interval until the QRS complex totally drops. Second degree Mo Mobitz type 2 is a little bit different. You have a normal PR interval, but then every once in a while, you just lose a, a QRS complex. The ventricles just don't uh, depolarize at all. Um, if you have a 2 to 1 block, then you have... Uh, count the P waves. So you have one, two, three, four here, but you only have one, two QRS complexes. In other words, you have P wave, QRS complex, normal, then you have P wave, drops, no QRS complex. The P wave, QRS complex, everything's normal, and then the P wave, and then you have no more QRS and it drops. So it's like two to one ratio. If you have a third degree heart block, if you follow these P waves, the P waves are happening uh, in normal synchron synchronicity, but there's no communication between the atrium or the SA node and then the rest of the ventricle. So you have the ventricles basically contracting on their own, ir irrespective of the SA node. Okay, so these are some examples of different types of heart blocks um, that you might see. If any of you go into like telemetry, if you're going to cardio, uh, cardiology, you're going to see stuff like this all the time. This is something that I saw personally. Um, this was one of my patients. Uh, this patient... I'll give you my pulmonary embolism story. Um, and it's pertinent to you guys as, as future nurses because it's a story about potential malpractice. Now, when I was working in cardiology, when I was doing my rotations, uh, there was a patient, she didn't speak any English, so it was kind of hard to communicate with her. I had to get a translator. But I saw on the charts, patient had respiratory distress and complained of chest pain. So what you're thinking, like, what are you thinking? You're thinking like heart attack, right? That's going to be like one of the biggest concerns is heart attack. So I went in there, looked at her vital signs. I saw that her heart rate was accelerated. Uh, she, she wasn't febrile, so she didn't have a fever. Um, and her respiratory rate said 18. I was like, that's really weird. You guys know what a normal respiratory rate is? It's like anywhere between like 12 to 20. 12 is kind of like average. Um, but anything above 20 is going to be uh, considered tachypnic. That's like really fast uh, respiratory rate. So I was like, that's strange. Why did they write down 18? That's just like normal. So the problem with measuring the respiratory rate is when you see your patient, you literally have to stand there and stare at their chest for one minute. And as a guy, and you have a female patient, that can be really awkward. Uh, and a lot of nurses, a lot of nurses are really busy. So they don't feel that the respiratory rate is super important. So oftentimes, they'll just write 18 on every single freaking chart. Okay, don't do that. Because when I sat there and I awkwardly stared at my pa patient's chest for a minute, 32 was the respiratory rate. This patient was like in absolute respiratory distress. So extremely tachypnic. What's up? 60 seconds is kind of the standard. Yeah, it's very awkward. <laughs> 60 seconds is best. I mean, I guess you could do it for 30 seconds, but you're probably not gonna get a very accurate read. What's up? Just breathing, just the chest movement. So you can do it while you're taking the patient's pulse. So you can like take the patient's pulse, look at your watch, and then kind of like stare at their respiratory rate. That's one way to do it so it's not super awkward. I had another question here. 
16. That's exactly what most nurses are doing. They're just writing 18, 16, and they just do it across the board. And okay, so here's the rest of the story. So I saw her, I looked at her EKG. And I was like, this is really weird. This, she had this abnormal, she had the S wave, she had that Q wave, she had that weird inverted T. And I was like, that sounds familiar because you don't really see this very often. Um, so I'm trying to recall from like med school what that meant. So I looked it up on PubMed and I was like, holy crap, this patient probably has a PE. So PE is a pulmonary embolism. It can kill a patient, um, especially if they have a saddle embolus. If they have something like that, a saddle embolus, they basically like interfere completely with the ability for blood to circulate, right? So you're blocking blood from getting into the pulmonary system, and that's often very fatal. Luckily for this patient, she had a pretty decently sized PE, but it was uh, small enough where she was able to get treated with uh, TPA, and it was no big deal. But I was a little pissed off about the nurse. So actually, like, I found the nurse, and I set her aside, and I was like, hey, listen, like, that patient had a pulmonary embolism. She could have died. You wrote down 18 as a respiratory rate. And the nurse got really mad at me for, like, calling her out. <laughs> so... No, no. Just don't be like that nurse and don't listen to your MA instructor and say 16 across the board. It's kind of important that the patient especially is complaining of chest pain and respiratory distress. You want to chart that information accurately because that'd be, if she died and then they like did a review, that nurse could have gotten in a lot of trouble, including the rest of us too. So, all right. That's, uh, this is a nightmare. This is, this is VTAC, ventricular tachycardia. For a patient like this, you would definitely want to uh, you would definitely want to defibrillate uh, uh, defibrillate the patient. <clears throat> and then this one over here, this one's kind of interesting. This is called tossade de points, which uh, is derived from French. It's called turning of the points. Um, it can be induced by lots of different things, some of which are antifungal drugs, certain antibiotics, certain antipsychotics. So lots of different kinds of drugs can actually result in tossade de points. Okay, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, you can also get that from long QT syndrome. Long QT syndrome, which is uh, shown right over here, right? This is normal uh, QT. If you get that T segment prolonged, it gets longer and longer. Eventually, it can basically throw the patient into torsade points. So that's another risk factor. <clears throat> this is just something kind of interesting. Um, it's hard to find a lot of information on this. Uh, you can only really find it if you go to the NASA website, the history. But these are all the, the different guys that were on um, the Apollo mission. So you had uh, uh, Armstrong. You had Buzz Aldrin. Actually, I met that guy. I got a chance to shake his hand when I was back in New York. Um, and so this is when they were launching off. Check out their EKG. Totally crazy. Like They're all like super tachycardic because you know it's like a high-stress situation. But it's kind of interesting to see over here that they kind of like flatlined. <laughs> I don't know if maybe the leads fell off of the AKG machine. Maybe the AKG machine stopped working or something. But it seems like they would have probably died <laughs> if it stayed like that. So I think that, that was, there was an error in those reads. But I, I tried to look it up uh, from NASA, but that's the only thing I could find was just the archives on the website. Um, this is cardioversion versus defibrillation. Um, cardioversion. Um, Cardioversion, you're going to want to use for things like, you can use it for like AFib, so atrial fibrillation, something that's really not too crazy. You're basically just resynchronizing everything, um, and you're using less in terms of joules, right? So you're not using as much energy, versus if you have a patient that's like in VFib or VTAC, especially VFib, because that patient's like going to die like right away. So you definitely want to do defibrillation. You want to like completely do a hard reset on their entire circuitry, and you're going to bring it up to a much higher uh, level of joules, uh, the patient is going to be unconscious. They're unconscious because they're not able to breathe, right? They're not able to get blood to the rest of their body. So they're going to be unconscious. They're not going to have a pulse as well. All right. <clears throat> so let's talk about what you see from uh, ST elevation changes. So ST elevation changes are going to be associated with damaged uh, cardiac myocytes, or myocytes that are very soon going to be fully damaged, right? So if a patient has like an acute MI, you're going to see something like an ST elevation. If they had long-term ischemia from like a previous MI, you're probably going to see ST depression. So here's your normal ST segment over here. If you see uh, ST elevation, you're thinking potentially injury. You're thinking myocardial infarction, all right? <clears throat> 
then if you see on a uh, EKG, uh, SD depression, you're thinking that patient had uh, ischemia. So here's another image of what that looks like. That's, the, that's from a STEMI. So that's the ST elevation MI. Okay, so very, very serious uh, situation. You need to definitely treat that patient right away. Hmm. And that's basically it for today. You guys have any questions before we go into quizzes? No? No questions at all? Okay.